All right, welcome to the complete OBGYN review for the USMLE Step 2. In this video, we're going to cover all OBGYN concepts that you need to know for the USMLE Step 2 with 200 review questions and some awesome mnemonics along the way. Let us begin with question 1. How much weight should a severely obese woman gain during pregnancy? So she's severely obese, how much weight should she gain? 15 pounds, 30 pounds, 50 pounds, or as much as she wants. She's severely obese, so she should be gaining about 15 pounds. An average woman should be gaining about 30 pounds, but an obese woman about 15 pounds, which is about four to nine kilograms, as you can see in this chart over here. Now you may have noticed that the heavier that she gets, the less weight she should be gaining, but again, even an obese woman should be gaining some weight. Now we just look at this slide over here, that maternal failure to gain weight is associated with IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction. The baby's not gonna grow as much as it needs to. If the mom is gaining too much weight, it's associated with conditions like diabetes and macrosomia. Now we take a look at this slide over here, just some commonly tested pregnancy nutrition facts that we should know, that things that should be avoided in pregnancy, things like undercooked meat, fish, and eggs, and unpasteurized dairy products. Things that are fine during pregnancy are moderate doses of caffeine, ginger for nausea and vomiting, and probiotics. Question number two, which prenatal diagnostic test is done during the 24 to 28 week period? Of these choices, the answer is gestational diabetes. This is generally done during the 24 to 28 week period, and you can take a look at the other choices to see when those tests are done. Now, gestational diabetes, even though it's generally done during the 24 to 28 week period, screening is recommended earlier if the patient has obesity and additional risk factors, such as PCOS or a prior macrosomic infant. Question number three, which of the following values normally decreases during pregnancy? Cardiac output, heart rate, blood volume, fibrinogen, or expiratory reserve volume? And the answer is expiratory reserve volume. The reason is, what happens is the diaphragm is squashed by the uterus, and this decreases the residual volume. There's not going to be as much empty space inside of her lungs. Everything's being squashed. And thus, ERV, expiratory reserve volume, will be decreased. Cardiac output will be increased because the baby needs blood too, and the same goes for heart rate. In terms of blood volume, yes, this will be increased, but I just made a point over here that blood pressure will actually decrease during the first 24 weeks, generally. And fibrinogen, this will be increased to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Question eight, nuchal translucency is recommended at how many weeks? And the answer is at about 11 to 14 weeks. They help us detect things like trisomies and other gene abnormalities. On the right image over here, we see a fetus with Down syndrome will there be an increased nuchal translucency thickness. Question nine, which antihypertensive can be taken during pregnancy? ACEs, ARBs, or nifedipine? The answer is nifedipine. Nifedipine and also labetalol and hydralazine can be taken during pregnancy. Methyldopa used to be given, but it's not really anymore. It's mainly nifedipine, labetalol, and hydralazine. ACEs and ARBs cause neonatal renal failure and other problems. Question 10. Which medication can cause Epstein anomaly? And the answer is, of all these choices, Epstein anomaly, remember, lithium. Lithium, Epstein anomaly. I always imagine Einstein for Epstein with a lisp for lisp lithium. Einstein with a lisp reminds us that Epstein anomaly is caused by lithium. Question 11, in hepatologically, saber shins, saddle nose, and Hutchinson's teeth are seen in, this is easy, we know this one already, congenital syphilis. These are all associated with congenital syphilis, as opposed to these other conditions where you could take a look at what uh, symptoms are associated with them. And in terms of treatment, well, congenital syphilis is with penicillin if mom is positive. And the other conditions, you could take a look at how we treat these congenital diseases. All right, we'll come back to HIV in another question. Question 12, a 24 year old pregnant woman presents at 14 weeks with abdominal pain and some bleeding from the cervix. Products of conception are found in the vaginal vault on pelvic exam, what is the next step? Hmm, so here we're gonna do ultrasound. And the reason is because we must determine if all the products of conception have been expelled, in which case it would be a complete abortion or not, in which case it would be an incomplete abortion. And there we'd have to do something like aspiration or a DNC. All right, here are the different types of abortion, and just remember that the missed abortion is by definition the one where we don't see any vaginal bleeding. Question 13. The onset of labor to six centimeters dilated is considered which stage of labor? So this we got to know for exam, that that's considered the first stage, the latent first stage of labor. And here's just a little mnemonic if you want to remember that latent has six letters in it, so that's until six centimeters. Here's just how long each stage should take. For example, the latent phase should take less than 20 hours and so on. You could take a look at this over here, but this is all for a nulli paris woman. Values are less for a multi paris woman. Question 14, what is considered normal fetal heart rate? And the answer is 110 to 160 beats per minute. All right, more than that is considered tachycardia, less than that is considered bradycardia. Normal range is 110 to 160. Question 15, no variability is a sign of not a healthy fetus, it's, a fe it's fetal acidemia. On exam day, if you see no, var no variability, it's a sign of fetal acidemia. This is a chart for variability of the baby and what they represent. 
And here, here we're going to come on to decelerations. Early decelerations is a sign of what? So what's early decelerations a sign of? So this is a sign, and you can take a look at the picture over here, the top picture where we see early decelerations. That's a sign of head compression. I just have a little poem on the bottom over here. The head comes out early. The placenta comes out late. Very liable with cord compression, so make no mistake. The head comes out early reminds us of head compressions that's seen in early decelerations. The placenta comes out late reminds us of placental insufficiency with late decelerations. And very liable with cord compressions reminds us that the cord compressions are represented by variable decelerations. Okay, here's just a chart from osmosis. We'll move on to now to the next question. What is the treatment for hyperemesis gravidarum? And the answer is vaccillamine pyridoxine and diet changes. These are how we treat hyperemesis gravidarum, not with cheeseburgers and fries. That would probably make things much worse. Bland food is what the woman wants to go with. All right, here's a little bit about hyperemesis gravidarum. And again, we diagnose it clinically. We look for electrolyte abnormalities. And of course, we want to look out for Wernicke. And if the woman is dehydrated, we would want to administer IV fluids. Question 18, another boring question. What is the best initial test for gestational diabetes mellitus? And the answer is the 50 gram glucose challenge test. The 100 gram one is done. If the first one is positive, we confirm with the three hour 100 gram glucose tolerance test. And as you recall, this is all between the 24 to 28 week period. All right, here's a little bit about gestational diabetes. And you can take a look at this chart over here. But again, it's, it's typically asymptomatic, but it may present with edema, polyhydramnios, or a large for gestational age infant. And of course, there are other complications as well. Question 19. Gestational hypertension is defined as systolic blood pressure above 140 or diastolic blood pressure above 90 that develops when at or after 20 weeks gestation. Before that, it's just considered chronic hypertension, but after 20 weeks, it's considered gestational hypertension. And if we have this along with proteinuria, that would be preeclampsia. Actually, if you have gestational hypertension plus any of the following things, it would be considered preeclampsia. Proteinuria, low platelets, creatinine, elevated, liver transamination, double, double the upper limit, pulmonary edema, or cerebral or visual changes. The only cure for preeclampsia is delivery at 30, 37 weeks, and if severe, before 37 weeks. And the Luba help syndrome on the bottom, what that is, hemolysis, elevated LFTs, and low platelets. And help is actually considered a variant of preeclampsia with a poor prognosis. Question 20. What precautions are taken for a woman with preeclampsia? The answer is, take a look at it, both A and B. We both we give both intrapartum magnesium drip and we give seizure prophylaxis for 24 hours postpartum. A thing to look out for is magnesium toxicity where we see somnolence and reflexia. It's increased risk in patients with renal insufficiency because magnesium is excreted primarily by the kidneys and we would treat it once it becomes severe with IV calcium gluconate. But of course, once you start seeing symptoms, you want to decrease the magnesium. All right, here's a reminder that patients with myasthenia gravis, magnesium sulfate is contraindicated because it, it could trigger a crisis, so we would give seizure prophylaxis with phthalprobic acid. Question 21, what is required in eclampsia management? And the answer is we want to limit fluid intake. We want to limit fluid intake in eclampsia. All right, we don't do routine monitoring of magnesium levels because unless she has impaired renal function, we wouldn't need to do that. We just monitor for clinical magnesium toxicity. All right, here's a little bit of eclampsia. Delivery is the only cure. Initiate emergency delivery once the patient is stable and convulsions are controlled, for example, magnesium, antiazepam if necessary, and seizure prophylaxis postpartum, just like in preeclampsia. Question 22. During the first trimester of urine culture, a woman is found to have a positive result. The patient is asymptomatic. What is the next step? And we want to treat it. We want to treat it. We give, for example, moxicillin clavulinate or cephalexin. All right, here's a little bit more. And the treatment for pyelonephritis in pregnancy First of all, we hospitalize. That's very important. We have to hospitalize the woman because it's so dangerous. We give IV fluids and IV third generation encephalosporins. Question 23. What is the first step in a case of a suspected ectopic pregnancy? The answer is transvaginal ultrasound, not an abdominal one. We've got to, we want to go transvaginal. And serial HCG levels if the ultrasound is non-diagnostic. Reminder that the ectopic pregnancy is most often found in the ampulla. Now, treatment for ectopic pregnancy, well, medical therapy would include methotrexate for small unruptured cases. Surgical options would include salpingectomy or salpingostomy. Salpingostomy would simply just take out that portion of the fallopian tube to allow the egg to escape, not take out the whole fallopian tube. And tubal rupture or hemoperitoneum are medical emergencies. Question 24, what's occurring in this image where we see the placental vessels in covering up the cervix. That is, well, vessels for vasa, vasa previa. This is vasa previa over here, and this is an umbilical cord vessel passing over the internal os. And if there's an acute bleed, of course, we want to do an emergency C-section or else the baby could die. And if, if diagnosed early, steroids are given at 24 to 32 weeks, 
for, to prepare the baby uh, for, to accelerate the lung maturation and close monitoring and scheduled C-section before 35 weeks. A little bit more about placenta previa. Placenta previa is where the placental covers the cervix. Most patients are asymptomatic. Something that we'd recommend is pelvic rest and intercourse abstinence. And if the patient is asymptomatic, we would do a C-section at about 36 to 37 weeks. All right, and placenta accreta is attachment of the placenta to the mitrium. This usually requires a hysterectomy to prevent life-threatening maternal hemorrhage. Again, in placenta accreta, that's unfortunately you have to go with hysterectomy. Question 25, painful dark vaginal bleeding is generally associated with? Where we see painful bleeding is generally with placental abruption. Usually in, in placenta previa and vasa previa, you don't see any pain, but in placental abruption, we would see painful bleeding. And then for some reason, the blood with placenta abruption is generally considered dark maroon color. And risk factors for placental abruption include tobacco or cocaine use. That's really important for exams. Hypertension, that's also important for exams. And abdominal trauma. All these can cause ischemia and necrosis to the maternal vessels at the uteroplacental interface that result in placental detachment. Question 26. What can cause polyhydramnios? Of all these choices, all of the above can cause polyhydramnios. For example, in a T fistula where the baby's not swallowing, the amniotic fluid will build up, causing polyhydramnios. And it's often idiopathic, by the way. Take a look at the slide over here about polyhydramnios, but it's when the AFI is above 25 on ultrasound. Question 27. Renal agenesis, where the kidneys are not formed, either bilaterally or unilaterally, that can cause oligohydramnios because the baby's not peeing out. So there's not going to be the proper amount of amniotic fluid being created. And if the baby isn't urinating, there won't be ad adequate amniotic fluid, as I just said. And it can lead to pulmonary hypoplasia and powder sequence. Oligohydramnios, you can take a look at the slide over here. We try to treat the underlying cause as much as possible. And again, this, just like polyhydramnios, this is often asymptomatic. Question 28, who should be given Rogam? RH negative mothers. Mom Roneg, get Rogam. Roneg, Rogam. All right, here's a little bit about Rogam. And remember, although the standard dose of Rogam is usually adequate, after the delivery of procedures, we have to use the clier betge test to determine if she needs a higher dose, which could be in about 50% of cases she can need a higher dose. Keep that in mind for exams. Question 29, what's going on over here? We see a positive pregnancy test and this ultrasound. The answer is, this is a molar pregnancy, a hydrodidiform mole. The transvaginal ultrasound shows a mass with cystic grape-like lesions. It's not a baby, it's a molar pregnancy. Here's a little about gestational trophoblastic disease. We note the difference between the complete and incomplete molar pregnancies. And you can take a look at the rest of this slide over here. In terms of treatment at the very bottom, we evacuate the uterus with a DNC, follow with weekly beta HD, treat malignancy with chemo, and possibly hysterectomy. Question 30, brachial plexus injuries upon delivery. What's the answer over here? What happens with them? They usually resolve spontaneously within a year. Okay, risk factors for shoulder dystocia, which dystocia, which we wrote over here, is uh, obesity, diabetes, and histo history of macrosomic infant. And maneuvers which are performed are both the McRoberts maneuver, where there's leg elevation, and suprapubic pressure, which we apply. You can take a look at the other maneuvers, which may be applied over here on the bottom. Question 31. A delivering one has reached 7 centimeters, so she's in the active phase. But there have been no change in dilation in 6 hours. What should be done? Be patient, reassurance, or amniotomy, oxytocin, and C-section if neither works? And the answer is this last choice over here. That's what should be done, because she's already in failure to progress. You can take a look at this chart over here, but I have to be honest that it's not complete. You can take a look at what the indicator indications are in terms of c-section when it comes to a failure to progress question 32 a woman breaks her bag of water at 31 weeks what is the next step so we want to give antibiotics and corticosteroids if she breaks her bag of water because over here antibiotics are given to prevent infection and corticosteroids are given to promote fetal lung maturity if the infect if there's infection or fetal distress we want to induce labor and if not all is going well we want to deliver at about 34 weeks question 33 what is the definition of preterm labor and the answer is both regular uterine contractions and cervical change at less than 37 weeks, meaning she's had both these contractions and cervical change at less than 37 weeks. That's the definition of preterm labor. You have to have both of these criteria. All right, here's just a little bit about preterm labor treatment. Question 34, what is the most common type of breach presentation? And the answer is the frank breach. I like to think of this one as the frank feet can touch the head. That's why it's frank, feet can touch the head. That's the most common one. That's about 50%, 75% of breach cases. And the cannonball is the complete one. Uh, here's a little bit about breach. We would recommend C-section in breach in most cases. Question 35, which of the following is there are normal changes after delivery? 
and all of these are normal after delivery. It's normal to have fever, lochia, contractions, uterine retention due to bladder atony and pudendal nerve injury, suprapubic pain, all of these are normal after delivery, and these will come up more in later questions. All right. Also, don't forget about coccidinia, which is tailbone pain, which occurs due to labor and most resolve spontaneously and don't need to worry about it, but the patient could present with exquisite tenderness on a palpation of the coccyx. Question 36, what is the most common type of postpartum hemorrhage where there's loss of more than a, a liter of blood? And the answer is uterine atony. Uterine atony can lead to postpartum hemorrhage and is the most common cause. Uterine atony is diagnosed by, by palpation, which reveals a soft, enlarged, boggy uterus. What we would do in the case is bimanual uterine massage. It's usually success successful and many other things if that doesn't work. For example, oxytocin, methogen, if the patient's not hypertensive, and PGF2-alpha prostaglandin. There's actually a uterine ballooning which can be done, and there's something new called the Jada balloon, which is works really well. But if bleeding just keeps on persisting with all of what they have done so far, we would consider a uterine ut internal iliac artery ligation, uterine artery embolization, or even as a last case resort, hysterectomy. Question 37. A woman presents with pickle fence fever curve a week after delivery. She does not respond to antibiotics. What is most likely diagnosis? This is septic pelvic thrombophlebitis where she gets these wavering up and down fevers, even up to like something like 105. That would be typical. And we treat with antibiotics and heparin anticoagulation for 7 to 10 days. Question 38. What is the most common presenting symptom in Sheehan syndrome? Where I have this picture from Sheehan in my uh, YouTube video on Sheehan syndrome, the answer is failure to lactate. A woman will present some time after delivery and she's not able to nurse and it's caused by the reduced prolactin. What's the best initial test for Sheehan syndrome? Provocative hormonal testing. What is the most accurate test? An MRI of the pituitary and the hypothalamus. How is uterine inversion treated? How do we treat uterine inversion? And the answer is we punch it back in. We punch it back in. That's how we treat uterine inversion. After tocolytic agent is given, we punch it back in. Question 40, how is mastitis treated? And the answer is both oral antibiotics and breastfeeding. Antibiotics to get rid of the infection and breastfeeding to prevent a buildup. Now, uh, antibiotics would include diclozacillin, cephalexin, and augmentin. And if there's no improvement in two to three days, we would evaluate for an abscess. Question 41, in which tanner stage does pubic hair develop? We could take a look over here, actually. It's stage two, pubic hair develops. You could take a look at these stages over here. In stage one, there's no pubic hair. Stage two, there's some pubic hair. Course three, in stage three, there's coarsening hair. Stage four, it spares the thigh. In stage five, which is about when the woman is 15 years old or the girl is 15 years old, there's coarse hair that goes onto the thigh. And you can take a look at the breast development at these stages. But at stage two is when the breast buds form. And at stage three is when the mound forms. And at stage five is when the areola flattens. Question 42, estrogen reaches its peak during which stage of the menstrual cycle? This is stage at day 14 by the LH surge. All right, you can take a look a bit about the menstrual cycle over here. And let's move on now to the next question. How is menopause diagnosed? It's actually a clinical diagnosis. LH and FSH will be decreased, but that's not necessary for diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis where the average age is 51. And we see these symptoms over here. Question 44, what is the initial treatment for menopause symptoms and it's HRT? Now, in general, we try to avoid treatment for menopause symptoms because of the side effects and risks associated with uh, replacement therapy. But in most people, so most people just deal with it. But in terms of the initial treatment, HRT and second line could be SSRIs, not TCAs. SSRIs if estrogen is not tolerated, for example. Question 45, which contraception method is permanent? This is pretty easy. Tubal ligation is generally considered permanent. These other ones are actually not. All right, the ones in blue over here are 99% effective or more. The next ones are 90 to 90%, and spermicide is not so effective. So if a woman really doesn't want to give have a baby, she should not be going with spermicide. Okay, and inhibit spermatility. You could take a look over here a little bit about these other types of contraceptive methods. Question 46, which of the following was a contraindication to estrogen type contraception? And the answer is all of these are contraindications. Migraine with aura could increase risk of stroke, and these other choices, you could take a look over here, and one of them is tobacco use, plus the woman is 35 years of age. That would be a contraindication to estrogen type contraception. Question 47, what is the most effective emergency contraceptive method of these choices? The copper IUD, that's even better than the morning after pill. But the thing is that this is pretty, un <laughs> even though this is the right answer, it's pretty impractical because who is going to get a doctor's appointment right after, you know, they usually have this emergency problem. You call the OBGYN, it takes a few weeks to get an appointment. So they usually go with the morning after pill, but in terms of which one would be the most effective, it actually be copper IOD. 
Question 48. In which ideology of primary amenorrhea is LHFSH elevated? It's going to be in hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Hypergonadotropic hypogonadism in women aged less than 40 is primary ovarian insufficiency. So we see elevated FSH and elevated LH, but we will see a decreased um, estrogen. Okay, so that's primary ovary, in, ovary insufficiency, hypogonotropic hypogonadism. Which test is done to distinguish between hydrogen, androgen insensitivity syndrome and malaria neogenesis if we can't tell between the two? The answer is karyotype analysis, 46XY and 46XX. A 16-year-old girl presents with a decreased appetite, insomnia, and amenorrhea for three months. What is the most likely diagnosis? Pregnancy, right? Sometimes we forget that, but it's pregnancy. We have to look out for that. We always have to look out for the HCG, beta HCG. We work, there's a workup for second day amenorrhea. It always begins with a pregnancy test. If it's negative, we measure the FSH, TSH, and prolactin because they're associated with these various conditions over here. And we will initiate the progestin challenge test. Signs of hyperglycemia and hypotension, we conduct the death methadone suppression test. Question 51, what is the treatment for premature ovarian failure? In a woman age less than 40, we would give replacement therapy, hormonal replacement therapy, estrogen, and progesterone. And to replace the hormones the ovary is not making. Gonadotropins to induce ovulation in hypothalamic-related amenorrhea. Question 52. How is primary dysmenorrhea diagnosed? We would diagnose this with exclusion. Nothing else is explaining why she's getting all this pain during her periods. It's exclusion. And we give NSAIDs, topical heat therapy, OCPs, and progestin IOG, but we gen generally go with NSAIDs. Question 53. Pain, menorrhagia, and an enlarged bog uterus are seen in adenomyosis, where we see endometrial tissue in the myometrium. In endometriosis, we don't see it in an enlarged uterus. That we'll see in, aden in adenomyosis. Here's a little mnemonic that I made a few years ago where we see dysmenorrhea and abnormal uterine bleeding sometimes. And she's saying, I don't know where my nose is, where the nose looks like this adenomyosis uh, specimen over here. And a guy with a knife saying, Gunner, Gunner for GnRH agonists. That's what we use to treat adenomyosis. And if all else fails, hysterectomy represented by the knife. Question 54. How is endometriosis diagnosed? And the answer is laparoscopic visualization. This, require, this requires direct visualization. What is the best initial treatment for menorrhagia? The answer is NSAIDs to pr reduce prostaglandin levels. That helps us treat the menorrhagia. All right. Trying to Axemic acid can be given for five days during menses, and OCP is progestin or a progestin IOD. Question 56. Diagnostic criteria for PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, include polycystic ovaries, oligo or anovulation, and what's the third one? The third one is hyperandrogenism, either clinical or biochemical. Now, the, so all you need is two or three of these to make a diagnosis of PCOS. Here's the thing that I remember I made on PCOS where we see often obesity, hyperandrogenism, such as the hair, unwanted hair, and the ansides for androgenism. Okay, I'm not sure if that was helpful at all. Treatment on the bottom we see over here, for example, if she wants to give birth, so we want to induce ovulation is with clomiphene and or metformin, and if not trying to conceive, combined hormonal contraception or progestin. We also want to encourage diet and weight loss for the obesity. Question 57, the definition of infertility is the inability to conceive after how many months? And the answer is 12 months if less than 35 and six months if more than 35. A little bit of, about infertility over here. Prior, primary infertility means no prior pregnancies. Ca secondary infertility means at least one prior pregnancy. Question 58, a 25-year-old woman comes in with a unilateral two-centimeter cyst at the medial labia majora. So this is a Bartholin cyst. What is the next step? The answer is no therapy because it's asymptomatic. We don't treat it. Bartholin cyst, if it develops into an abscess, it would be extremely painful, and then we would treat it. Uh, we would give warm soak, well, for the asymptomatic ones, we would give warm soaks, possibly. Aspiration and drainage for an abscess. And antibiotics unnecessary unless there's cellulitis or STI present. All right, Bartholin cyst, big violin. Not sure if this was helpful. Let's move on. Question 59. Abnormal gray milky discharge, vaginal pH above 4.5, a positive whiff test, and more than 20% clue cells on wet mount. What is this seen in? Well, all you need is a whiff test. But all of these things point in the direction of bacterial valaginosis, where we'd see the gray and milky discharge and treat with mitronidazole or vaginal clindamycin. You can take a look at what we would do in TRIC and in the yeast infection in Candida. Question 60. How is PID diagnosed? This is a clinical diagnosis, just like several of these, several other diseases that we've seen so far. Clinically, we, it's an acute lower abdominal pelvic pain and either uterine adnexal or CM tenderness and HCG to rule out pregnancy. That's what we do in PID. It's a clinical diagnosis. 
All right, take a look over here at complications. For example, Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, where we'd see perihepatitis, right or quadrant pain, and abnormal liver function in addition to the PID. All right, C acute causes of pelvic pain, you could take a look over here at acute causes of pelvic pain and how they would present. Question 61, when do fibroids grow in size? Fibroids grow with pregnancy because of the increased estrogen. It's hormone sensitive. As opposed to after menopause, they would decrease and they often resolve. Here's a little bit more about fibroids. If asymptomatic, no treatment. Symptomatic, we give combined hormonal contraception, medroxyprogesterone acetate, or danazole to stop the bleeding, GnRH agonists, and you can take a look over here. You can take a look what we do, and we would consider myomectomy or hysterectomy, if done and not having children. The hysterology of lyomyoma, the fibroids, includes a world pattern of smooth muscle, smooth muscle bundles. This is more for step one than for step two, but it just in case it comes up. Question 61. A woman in pregnancy may present with contractions and with acute onset abdominal pain along with abdominal mass and leukocytosis. On exams, this would be a degenerating uterine lyomyoma, again, where there's pain and along with a mass and leukocytosis, that would be a degenerating uterine lyomyoma. Question 62. Vaginal bleeding is always present in endometrial carcinoma. True or false? The answer is it's false only 80% of the time. Okay, vaginal pain, by the way, is the later finding. Question 63. Which type of endometrial cancer grows with unopposed estrogen stimulation? This is the endometrioid form, which is the less dangerous form, but it grows with unopposed estrogen stimulation. And it presents at about five, 55 years of age and a favorable prognosis, as opposed to the serous form, which is not. Question 64, when does cervical cancer screening begin? At age 21. We start doing the pap smears at age 21, and about every three years according to guidelines, but I've never heard of an OBGYN who didn't do it every year. They all do it every year. But anyway, according to guidelines, it's every three years, okay? Before 21, there's no screening. Between 30 to 65, every three years, or co-testing every five years, and at 65, we stopped the screening if prior tests were all negative. Question 65, lichen sclerosis. I'll just go through these pretty quickly because they're pretty boring until the question 100. Lichen sclerosis presents with an intense pruritus, dyspernia, and dyskesia. All right, lichen sclerosis is itchy, and there's a risk for squamous cell carcinoma, lichen sclerosis. 66, simplex chronicus, chronicus is leathery vulvar skin, and it's not malignant. All right, here we see the leather skin. She's saying, I like simple. I like it simple. Leather, leathery skin is seen in lichen simplex chronicus. Question 67, vulvar cancer is both a result from longstanding lichen sclerosis and associated with HPV vulvar cancer. Okay. Here we see a picture of it. Extra mammary page disease is associated with pruritus, erythema, and crusting. It's not associated with an underlying carcinoma. That's with the breast. But of the, of the extra mammary page disease is not associated with an underlying carcinoma. But it's associated with pruritus, erythema, and crusting. And here we see a picture of erith extra mammary page disease. And here we see the histology where we see the keratin. This again, this is more of a step one thing than of step two. Okay, keratin, and it's a carcinoma. All right, in peripheral hymen, if untreated, leads to amenorrhea and abdominal pain. She's not going to, of course, have her periods because it's all closed up. All right, um, here's the normal one. Here's the imperforate one. Clear cell adenocarcinoma is associated with DES exposure, but it's been so long since they've been giving this, and therefore you're not going to see it too much. Here's don't take DES. Are we clear? Because that's in clear cell carcinoma. Clear cell adenocarcinoma is associated with DES. And here we see the epithelium, the glandular columnar epithelium. Okay. Sarcoma botrytis does not affect older females, it affects younger ones, little kids often, and it's spindle-shaped cells and is desmin positive. All right, botrytis means a grape-like mass, so that's what we see. This can also come up in the, in the penis in boys, actually. All right, here we see a video, I'm not going to play it over here, this is more of a step one thing. Question 72, cervical dysplasia. It begins at the basal letter and extends downward, and it's typically asymptomatic and is detected with pap smear, but it may present as abnormal vaginal bleeding, especially postcoital, that cervical dysplasia. It does not present with pain. And we see this over here, the different stages of CIN. E6 is the one that inhibits P53, and E7, PRB. E6, eol with the sticks at the bank over here, at the 53rd bank, that's because it's P53, E6, P53. This is question 73. What histologic finding is associated with cervical dysplasia? That would be the coilocytes. They represent the HPV, the coiled up raisins. They represent HPV. Remember the high risk ones? 16, 18, 31, and 33. All right, here we see over here. Well, how does cervical carcinoma lead to renal failure? It's actually a physical obstruction blockage of the ureters. Okay. Here we see, let's move on. Primary ovarian insufficiency is diagnosed when FSH is high and estrogen is low. All right, here we see the fish FSH is high and estrogen is low. Fish for FSH. Question 76, which of the following can cause anovulation? The answer is all of these can cause anovulation. 
And you can take a look at why, for example, in eating disorders, the ovaries shrink. In athletics, exercise hormonal imbalance and low body fat. You can take a look at the other choices. Question 77. In patients with exercise-induced amenorrhea, LH levels will be reduced. LH will be reduced. So it leads to there's going to be a reduction in LH and, of course, in estrogen. She will stop menstruating and will have decreased bone density, actually, due to the decreased estrogen. So we want to treat this. Question 78. It should be 78. I'm not sure why it says 74, but it does. Question 74. Adnexal torsion is definitely an emergency, and this is the pathophysiology of it. Pathophysiology of it, and it's definitely an emergency. You have to treat it with surgery. Question 75. The most common pelvic organ prolapse is the bladder, the anterior compartment, a cystocele. That's the most common pelvic organ prolapse. It's due to damage to the later anti-muscle complex. That's all pelvic organ, pro organ prolapse is. Asymptomatic patients do not require treatment. Uterine prosthodontia is a form of pelvic organ prolapse in which the entire uterus her herniates. Uh, they generally need surgery. Pestry could help, but it's usually surgery. Endometritis is associated with, well, actually, I'm going to skip this question because it's not worded the way I wanted it, but it's clindamycin and gentamicin for, for endometritis. Question 77, follicular ovarian cysts are definitely common and they resolve spontaneously, all right? Question 78, which of the following are risk factors for ovarian tumor? The answer is more ov ovulations, more ovarian cancer. So older age, they've had more menstrual cycles. Early menarche, late menopause, more menstrual cycles, endometriosis, and BRCA1 mutation are all associated with ovarian tumor. If a woman has taken uh, OCPs or she's had previous pregnancies, she has lower risk for ovarian tumor. Ovary germ cell tumors arise from the egg. These are the associations. Brenner tumors are urethritol-like. That's Brenner is bladder-like. Brenner bladder-like. Mature cystic teratoma is all these things over here. Again, I'm going quickly because there's more step one stuff over here. Here's a, a look at the cystic teratoma. We see the um, different like the hair and the teeth in it. Question 82: Granulosis cell tumor. All of these is the most common malignant sex cord stromal tumor, and it produces estrogen, so the woman will be more estrogen-like, and it could cause postmenopausal bleeding. It reveals call X in her body as an elevated inhibin tumor marker. Okay, here's a take a look over here. We see him calling his grand calling granny call X in her bodies in the granulosa cell tumors. So total ligo cell tumors are not malignant, they resemble testicular histology, and therefore there will be virilization often, such as hirsutism, hirsutism and a male pattern baldness. 84 fibromas can cause Meg syndrome, triad of ovarian fibroma ascites, and a pleural effusion. 85, which pathogen causes acute mastitis? Staph aureus. Here's the mastitis. Fat necrosis of the breast is not malignant and reveals a calcified oil cyst on biopsy. And here we see the fat necrosis. We see the oil cyst due to the calcifications and necrotic fat tissue. And it's usually due to trauma. The woman may not recognize it. For example, she got hit by a baseball, but this is the fat necrosis. 87. Fibrocystic changes are usually not a risk for cancer. It's usually not a risk for cancer and generally occur in females ages 20 to 50 who see changing hormonal levels present in the blood. All right, fibrocystic changes. Question 88, introductal papillomas are associated with, these are the bloody ones, introductal papillomas. The papilloma is blocking the duct and it can bleed. And it is a small fibroepithelial tumor right beneath the areola. Question 89, Paget's disease of the nipple is associated with an underlying malignancy and absolutely, as opposed to Paget's disease of the vulva, which is not, here we see an underlying malignancy. Question 90, invasive ductal carcinoma of the breast is both A and B. It forms a firm, fibrous, rock-hard mass with sharp margins, and it may cause nipple retractions. And we want to do a biopsy to see if it's malignant. That's invasive ductal carcinoma. Question 91, inflammatory carcinoma of the breast. It appears warm, swollen, and red, and it is very malignant as a poor prognosis. Question 92, ER and PR expressing tumor cells would respond to tamoxifen, utrastuzumab, that would be HER2 new. This HER2 new staining we'd see on the border since its expression is on the cell membrane, as opposed to estrogen and progesterone. There, if we see a, we would see that in the inside the nucleus. Okay, so this is how we know we're talking about over here, a HER2 new staining on the right. Question 93, bilateral breast tenderness, fibrocystic changes, and early satiety, and a complex ovarian mass. These are all seen in granulosa cell tumors. Again, we see the breast tenderness due to the estrogen effects on the breasts, and we would see a complex ovarian mass. Question 94, a 68-year-old woman has severe vulvar itching and burning for seven months. P shows thin, dry, white plaque-like vulvar skin with loss of the labia minora. So this is vulvar lichen sclerosis, and we want to do a punch biopsy to confirm the diagnosis and to rule out vulvar cancer. What's the best treatment for lichen sclerosis? That's steroids. 
So, for example, clobetazol, which decreases chronic inflammation and can also prevent disease progression to evolve or cancer. Question 96. Hyperandrogenism in pregnancy is commonly due to benign bilateral ovarian masses such as thecoluganin cysts and luteomas. Question 97. Fever and diffuse abdominal pain worse on one side. A multilactinated ag- complex agonexal mass is a tubo-ovarian abscess. The patient is often going to have fever because there's an infection, and this is the tubo-ovarian abscess. A, a seven-year-old girl with precocious puberty and a large adnexal mass. That's what she has. What is the diagnosis? So here we have a granulosa cell tumor. Because of increased estrogen, she's maturing early in terms of sexuality. An adolescent girl discovers a breast mass with clinical features consists with fibroadenoma. What's the next step? So she's got this unilateral, firm, mobile, well-subscribed upper outer quadrant mass. What would we do? Observation and re-examination in six weeks. We want to do, it's not no further testing, we want to re-examine it. Question 100. A 10-year-old girl has vulvar itching that has worsened over the last few months. Exam of the vulva reveals thin white skin with excoriation extending to the perianal area. She has not had her first period yet. What is the next step? So here again, the answer is steroids. This is actually talking again about like in sclerosis. It could even show up in girls, not just in old ladies. Question 101. A 27-year-old woman with a previous abortion comes in at 32 weeks. Fetal tones are not <laughs> heard, not heart. An ultrasound reveals no cardiac activity. What should you respond when the patient asks why it happened? And of course, we'll never know the reason. We can do further testing, but we never know the reason for this. Question 102. A 33-year-old woman who delivered six weeks ago with a complication of severe postpartum bleeding now complains of fatigue, poor appetite, and poor lactation. Hmm. Bleeding, now poor lactation. That sounds like Sheehan syndrome. She has lost 20 pounds relative to her pre-pregnancy weight. What is the cause? This is Sheehan syndrome, which is due to pituitary necrosis. Sheehan syndrome is typically presents with lactation failure due to prolactin deficiency as well as hypotension and anorexia due to secondary adrenal insufficiency due to impaired ACTH secretion. Question number three. 27 year old woman has severe dysmenorrhea and dysmenorrhea. Speculum examines normal. What is the best treatment? So, over here, we want to give combination oral contraceptives, combination oral contraceptive and NSAIDs for endometriosis. This treats the inflammation and suppresses the ovarian stimulation of endometriosis. And by the way, how do we diagnose? We don't have to make an actual diagnosis of it. We have to do laparoscopic eva- uh, visualization and, to, and for resection. 104. A 31-year-old woman at 30 weeks pregnant was struck in the abdomen in a car accident. Her pants are soaked with blood and her abdomen is in pain. Blood pressure is extremely low and her extremities are cool. Pulses 140 a minute. Uterine contractions occur every few minutes. Hmm. IV fluids are started. What is the next step? So over here, she has this extreme hypotension. We want to give a blood transfusion. We, want, we don't want to do a, a fetal biophysical profile. We have to take care of the mother. What's going on over here is that she likely had a fetal abruptio placente. Question 105. A woman pregnant with monocaryotic diaminatic twins is at increased risk of which complication? The answer is twin-twin transfusion syndrome. This is monocaryotic, by the way. It means one placenta. And this increases the risk for twin-twin transfusion syndrome, where unbalanced AV anastomoses are present between the shared placental vessels. High pressure from the arteries from one twin is sent to the placental veins of the other twin, and this increases the risk of mortality in both twins. Question 106. A 26-year-old female bleeds more and more after a vaginal delivery. Blood pressure is very low. Hemoglobin is low. Platelets are low. PTINR and PTTR are prolonged. What is the diagnosis? This is exact. DIC is. DIC is when there are low platelets because they're all being used up. It's postpartum hemorrhage can cause it due to a large volume of bleeding and what happens is tissue factor is released which leads to an elevation and activation of the coagulation cascade leading to elevation in thrombi platelet consumption and this is why pt and ptt will be elevated all right treatment is emergency supportive care and resuscitation with blood products question 107 a 33 year old woman presents six weeks after labor with fatigue and poor sleep she also has an end steady gait and increased knee reflexes what is the next step not reassurance because this might be the first presenting symptom of her MS. Okay, there's an increased risk postpartum. Pregnancy is protective, but postpartum is an increased risk, both um, both in terms of initial presentation and relapses. 108. A 22-year-old female counts, comes in complaining of excess facial hair, acne, and irregular menstrual cycles. She has normal external female genitalia, but serum 17-hydroxyprogesterone and DHEAS are elevated. What is the diagnosis? This is not polycystic ovary syndrome. This is non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia. In polycystic ovary syndrome, we would not see Hyper, we would see hyperandrogenism, but we would not see an elevated 17 hydroxyprogesterone. That's a non classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia. We would see an elevation of 17 hydroxyprogesterone, which shifts towards the adrenal androgen synthesis, leading to hypergenism, and usually presents in late teens or early adulthood with acne and hirsutism. Question 109. A 32-year-old woman at 41 weeks comes in into her OBGYN. She complains of lack of movement. Fetal testing shows late decelerations. Remember, late. The placenta comes out late. Placental, uteroplacental insufficiency. And that's the answer. Uteroplacental insufficiency. That's what's going on over here. Placenta comes out late. 
Here's a little about uh, uterine placental deficiency. Question 110. A 34-year-old woman at 38 weeks has sudden vaginal bleeding and severe low abdominal pain. Hmm. Cervix is dilated to 3 centimeters. Contractions occur every 2 minutes. What is the complication of her state? Well, what's going on over here is that she has abruptio placente. That's why she has this sudden vaginal bleeding and severe low abdominal pain and the, that's why she's having these contractions and the complication of her state is hemorrhage of course it leads to bleeding bleeding is caused by the placental detachment and the accumulation of blood increases injury during pressure leading to abdominal or back pain some cases are self-limited but complications include hemorrhage hypovolemic shock and dic and preeclampsia and smoking are risk factors for abruptio placente Question 111. A 29-year-old woman at 17 weeks comes in with polydipsia, nocturia, and polyuria. Her urinalysis shows low specific gravity, so her urine is very dilute. Her serum sodium is normal. So it's normal serum sodium, yet her urine is dilute. That means we're talking about diabetes insipidus because they're not able to concentrate their urine. And remember, there are two types, either a lack of response to ADH or insufficient ADH. And it can present at pregnancy, dentally produce enzymes, increase ADH breakdown, and may resolve with the delivery of the baby. Question 112. A 32-year-old woman has postpartum hemorrhage a week after delivery. Exam shows no laceration, but the cervix is slightly dilated, and there's active bleeding from the os. That should not be ox. <laughs> that should be os. She has no fever. The uterus is small, firm, and non-tender. So we know it's not uterine atony. PT is 11 seconds. PTT is 36. Again, there's a lot of typos here. And BT Bleeding time is 14 minutes. That's an increased bleeding time. What is the cause of the hemorrhage? So the bleeding time is increased. That's von Willebrand disease, right? We may, may we don't see an elevated PT. We may see an elevated PTT, but we see an elevated bleeding time. This could be, that's why there's a postpartum hemorrhage over here. In uterine atony, we would see an enlarged soft uterus and in retained products of conception, we'd see pelvic pain and fever. Question 113, what is this fetal tracing a sign of? So here we see variable decelerations very liable in cord compressions. Umbilical cord compressions are seen in variable in, in um, variable decelerations. Question 114. What is first-line management of recurrent variable decelerations? For example, more than 50% of the time, we want to do maternal repositioning. This could help. For example, you would do left lateral on all fours. This can reduce the cord compression. If that doesn't work, we would go with amnio infusion. That could be given. This provides more amniotic fluid, which can reduce the compression. All right, oxytocin would actually worsen the umbilical cord compression. Question 115. A 33-year-old woman presents with symptomatic anemia due to heavy menstrual periods. So she has, for example, syncope. Biomanual exam reveals a large, irregularly shaped uterus. Pregnancy test is positive. What is the cause? This is proliferation of smooth muscle in the myometrium. Right? This is lyomyomas. This could cause her to have these heavy menstrual periods and the large, irregularly shaped uterus. Endometrial gland and stroma in the myometrium, that's endomyosis. That typically, typically presents with a uniformly enlarged uterus and diffuse uterine tenderness. The different types of fibroids. Uh, let's move on to the next one. A 31-year-old woman comes in her pre first prenatal visit at third nine weeks gestation. Her first pregnancy required penicillin during labor for GBS. She lives in a home built in 1980. What screening test is required at this visit? So she's at nine weeks gestation. She does not require GBS. That's what we do right before the delivery. Actually, what she requires is HBV screening. Universal screening for HIV, HBV, and syphilis at the first visit. Serum lead level will be in homes built before 1978. Question 117, a 20-year-old female presents with high fever, hypotension, tachycardia, and diffuse red macular rash on her entire body, including palms and soles. She uses tampons for heavy bleeding. We know what this is. Blood pressure is low. This is staph aureus causing toxic shock syndrome. 118, a pregnant woman at 32 weeks gestation presents with severe heartburn and right upper quadrant pain. Blood pressure is high, nuance at hypertension. Platelets are low. Urine dipstick shows 2 plus protein. So we're talking about preeclampsia here with severe features. She is mildly hyperglycemic. What is the cause of her symptoms? She is mildly hyperglycemic. What is the cause of her pain? So it's not going to be fatty infiltration of the liver. That would be fatty, acute fatty liver. There we would see hypoglycemia. This is distension of the liver capsule because here we're seeing HELP syndrome. Preeclampsia with severe features, which has progressed to HELP. 119, a woman with preeclampsia develops dyspnea, hypoxia, 3 plus pitting edema of the lower extremities, and bibasilar crackles. What is the diagnosis? So what happened over here? She developed these bibasilar crackles. This is pulmonary edema. 
which is a life-threatening complication of preeclampsia with severe features. What happens is in preeclampsia, the generalized arterial vasospasm leads to increased SVR and increase in afterload. There will be an increase in pulmonary capillary pressure, which drives fluid from the capillaries into the interstitium. That's what the pulmonary edema is. And this increased capillary permeability also promotes decreased serum abdomen levels, leading to peripheral edema. Question 120. A 23-year-old woman has hirsutism and acne that started developing a few months ago. She also has lost 12 pounds. Pelvic exam shows an enlarged clitoris, but no other abnormal genitalia. Total testosterone is elevated, but DHEAS is normal. What is the diagnosis? So here we see hirsutism, weight loss, and testosterone is elevated. This is Sertoli light thick cell tumor, where we see elevated testosterone and virilization. In PCOS, again, we don't see virilization. And aromatase deficiency, we see virilization, but we don't see an elevation of DHEAS. All right, and this is just my video over here. We see the in the Sertoli Light Excel video, this woman with virilization. Question 121, a 26-year-old woman comes in a 25-week gestation. An ultrasound shows AFI is 40 centimeters, so that's high, and a tracheoesophageal fistula is visualized. What is the patient at risk for? So we see polyhydramnios, there's an increased risk for preterm labor. Polyhydramnios, as we mentioned earlier in the video, there's an increased risk for preterm labor and preterm rupture of membranes due to uterine overdistension. Question 122. A 35-year-old woman comes in at 33 weeks gestation due to the right up quadrant pain that occurs several times a day. Blood pressure is 135 over 83. BMI is 23. What is most likely the cause? So why would a pregnant woman have right upper quadrant pain that occurs several times a day? That's due possibly to a gallstone that's obstructing the sixth duct, biliary colic. That's common during pregnancy due to increased gallstone formation. Stretching of the liver capsule, nah. That we would see, for example, in preeclampsia with severe features, where would there be elevation of blood pressure? Question 123. A 23-year-old pregnant, non-pregnant woman comes in for mild sharp pain in her left lower abdomen. She has a 3.5 centimeter non-tender mass palpable in the left and next step. Ultrafound confirms less variances. What's the next step? Observation and follow-up. That's usually resolved spontaneously. Aspiration of the cyst is rarely indicated. Question 124. A month after delivering a baby, a 27-year-old woman presents with malodorous vaginal discharge. On exam, there's a small dark red area on the posterior vaginal wall with an associated tan brown discharge. I'm not sure why this is so high yield to this question. It comes up so much. What's the diagnosis? This is a rectovaginal fistula where we see a connection between the vagina and the rectum. Often occurs after the third or fourth degree laceration with poor wound repair and treatments with surgery. Question 125. A 20-year-old woman presents two months postpartum with slightly malodorous vaginal discharge. No other symptoms. Vital signs are normal. The small area of vaginal lesion to the anterior vaginal wall. So here we see an aberrant connection between the vagina and the bladder. And here we got to do a bladder dye test because here we're talking about a vesicovaginal fistula where we see these symptoms, continuous clear vaginal discharge, abnormally elevated pH due to the urine, and treatment again is with surgery. Question 126. Women with short interpregnancy intervals between 16 and 18 months between delivery and the next pregnancy have an increased risk for preterm labor rupture of membranes, not increased birth weight, a decreased birth weight possibly due to persistent stress and inflammation. Question 127. A 28-year-old woman comes in at 41 weeks with no complaints. Everything's fine so far. Vital signs are normal. Ultrasound reveals a vertex fetus and the single deepest pocket of AF is 1.1. That's really low. We want it to be 2. This is oligohydramnios. So you have a 41-week woman with oligohydramnios we want to induce because that's really dangerous. Once you're at 41 weeks and you have oligohydramnios, that's a big problem. 128. Which of the following is an absolute contraindication to methotrexate? All of these are contraindications for methotrexate. HIV, anemia, active pulmonary disease, hepatic or renal disease, and breastfeeding, because it could actually go through the breast milk. Question 129. A 58-year-old woman has no complaints except for a recent menstrual period a few days ago. Since her menopause five years earlier, what's the next step? Reassurance of biopsy. <laughs> we want a biopsy. She has this postmenopausal bleeding. We want we require a pap smear to evaluate cervical cancer and either endometrial biopsy or transvaginal ultrasound to evaluate endometrial cancer. I just wrote in the note over here that in women who initially undergo a transvaginal ultrasound, those with an endometrium of less than four millimeters require no additional evaluation, but if they have an endometrium bigger than four millimeters, they require an endometrial biopsy. Question 130. A woman at 36 weeks gestation undergoes a non-stress test, which is non-reactive. So this could be either good or bad. It could be bad because it's non-reactive, or it could be fine. Maybe the baby's sleeping. Biophysical profile is 8, so that's fine. That's why the answer is reassurance, because even though we want the non-stress test, meaning if it's non-reactive. Question 131. A pregnant woman has two prior consecutive painless third trimester losses. Her cervical length now at 14 weeks is normal, about 3 centimeters. What's the next step? A circlage, because this would be an indication for a circlage since you said who prior consecutive painless second trimester losses. Cervical insufficiency is very important, is diagnosed by one of the following criteria. Either painless cervical dilation in the current pregnancy, a second trimester cervical length of less than 2.5 plus a prior preterm delivery, or more at least two prior consecutive 
painless second trimester losses, and that was what was going on in our case over here. Management is with a circulation in the first trimester. We will remove the suture to allow vaginal delivery. Question 132. Several days after birth, a 26-year-old woman presents with heavy dark red vaginal bleeding with small clots. Physical exam and are normal. What's the next step? This is Lokia. So observation and reassurance, as opposed to these other conditions, for example, Von Wilbrand testing we would do if we saw anemia and large clots, DNC for retained products, a soft bog uterus would be seen. Just Lokia, we see the Lokia rubra, Lokia serosa, and Lokia alba, the different stages. For example, Lokia rubra is going to be this dark red, the serosa, about 10 days long, is this pink, and then Lokia alba is this like yellow color. Question 133, a 77-year-old woman at 37 weeks comes to the ED due to severe abdominal pain. She has had a previous C-section and is scheduled for another one in two weeks. PE shows vaginal bleeding and a palpable irregular tuberant in lower abdomen. Feel heart tracing is abnormal. What's the step? So he's severe abdominal pain and these parts are felt. This is uterine rupture. In a rupture placenta, we wouldn't hear these protuberances. We wouldn't feel the protuberances. We would see that in uterine rupture. And a C-section is a major risk factor. It leaves a weakened scar that's prone to rupture. And abdominal fetal heart rate tracing is often the first sign, such as bradycardia or variable or late decelerations. 134. A 33-year-old woman comes in six weeks after delivery to discuss contraception she does not want to gain weight and admits that she's not responsible with pills. She's generally a heavy menstrual bleeder. What is the best contraception for her? So we would want to give progestin releasing intrauterine device. That would be good for her because it's highly effective and it has a low incidence of systemic effects. So there's weight gaining mood and it decreases heavy menstrual bleeding. Look at these other choices. For example, a copper device would increase menstrual bleeding and methotrexate progesterone is associated with the weight gain. 135. Premature rupture of membranes, fever, nausea, vomiting, and uterine funnel tennis is seen in chorioamnionitis. That's why we see this fever due to the infection and the uterine fundal tenderness. And the risk factor is premature rupture of membranes. That's why we want to give antibiotics in the case of premature rupture of membranes. In PID, we see thick mucus, and it's not during, generally seen in the third trimester. I'm not sure why I wrote third trimester, but that's what I wrote over here. Question 136, what's the next step for this woman besides antibiotics? We want to give vaginal delivery. No reason for the C-section. Vaginal delivery is fine. And tocolytics are contraindicated in intra-amniotic infection. 137, a 30-year-old woman comes in six weeks after labor for a postpartum visit. Her pregnancy was complicated by gestational diabetes mellitus and preeclampsia with severe features. What's the next step? So we want to give another two-hour oral glucose tolerance test. We want to check the gestational diabetes mellitus postpartum. Screening six to 12 weeks postpartum. Urine collection we don't do after the pregnancy. Question 138, which RHD negative mothers requires anti-D immunoglobulin? All of these require the anti-D immunoglobulin program. Patient at 28 to 32 weeks, within 27, 72 hours of delivery of an RHD positive baby, and within 72 hours of spontaneous abortion and second and third trimester bleeding. 139, PID with high fever and vomiting is managed with inpatient treatment. This is very dangerous, and that's why we give, doc and we give doxycycline and cephalosporin, not outpatient treatment. PID indications for inpatient treatment, you can take a look over here. Question 140, smelly, thin, yellow-green vaginal discharge, vaginal erythema, and elevated vaginal pH. So yellow-green, this is the flagellated organisms. This is trichinoma, which is called trick, 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 as opposed to clue cells, that's gardnerella. Gray-white discharge, no erythema. Question 141, needle natal lupus involves primary cutaneous and cardiac findings. Not renal, primary cutaneous and cardiac findings. We see heart problems, all right? For example, fetal AV block develops at 18 to 24 weeks gestation as maternal antibodies bind to fetal cardiac cells, damaging the AV node, and they show up on the tracing as persistent bradycardia. Question 142. A woman has irregular menses, an elevated testosterone, and an LH-FSH imbalance. So this sounds like PCOS. Why is she infertile? That's failure of the follicle to mature. Let's take a look at the pathophysiology. There's persistently elevated estrogen levels, which leads to high-frequency short GnRH impulses, leading to an imbalance in LH and FSH, leading to an uh, inability of the LH surge, leading to a failure of the follicle to mature. As opposed to primary ovarian symmetry, there will be normal testosterone. That's why this was an answer to the question. Question 143. A patient says, I am sorry, doctor, but I have made up my mind. I am having a home birth. What should you say? Well, you want to be on the same page as them. Let's discuss the areas in which you should come to the hospital when delivering at home. Balance safety with patient autonomy. You have to be on the same page as them. You have to respect them. Let's move on. Question 145, what is going on with the curve D over here? This is active phase arrest. Active phase arrest is no cervical change in at least four hours with adequate contractions or no change in at least six hours with inadequate contractions. Labor rest is managed with C-section. We saw this at the earlier part of this lecture. Question 146, what is the first line treatment for migraines during pregnancy? Acetaminophen. Acetaminophen, not 
NSAIDs are the second line, and those are not safe in the first and third trimesters. Opioids and antiemetics uh, um, can be used as second line. Question 147. Third trimester miscarriage plus an elevated total of bile acids and generalized pruritus and platelets are 140,000. So this is not help. We would see much lower platelets. This is intrahepatic cholestasis in which the pruritus is worse on the hands and feet. It occurs in the third trimester as an elevated estrogen and progestin levels lead to biliary stasis, and as a bile acid crosses the placenta, it could lead to a miscarriage. Management is with uracetocolic acid antihistamine delivery at 37 weeks gestation. 148, a 38 year old woman complains of urinary incontinence. She was diagnosed with MS. What's the mechanism? This is muscle overactivity because what happens is the detrusor has muscle overactivity due to loss of upper motor neuron inhibition of the detrusor contraction, leading to urge incontinence. She suddenly feels the need to go to the bathroom, not the other choices. All right, 149, which woman can have a vaginal delivery? This is one who had a history of a horizontal C-section, but if she had a vertical classic C-section, that is a contraindication, along with extensive myomectomy because of the weakened uterus. Okay, a 20-year-old woman who hasn't seen a doctor in 15 years comes to meet with OBJN, what is recommended? So in this visit, she's gonna get an HPV vaccine. She's 20, so she's not gonna pap smear yet. That begins at 21 whether or not they have sex activity. HPV vaccine also not indicated in pregnancy. Question 151, it is discovered through testing that a fetus has bilateral renal agenesis. The fetus is in breech position and mom's going to labor. What, how should the baby be delivered? Vaginally. We don't try to do C-section because of the increased risks and there's no point because the baby is has a uh, this um, lethal fetal anomaly, right? It's not gonna live anyway, more than a few hours, even if it does. And uh, other conditions like anencephaly and holoprosencephaly have the same status. Question 152, a 15 year old girl hasn't had a period for four months. Her blood pressure is 152 over 93. There is a non-tender palpable mass in the lower abdomen. Serum beta HCD is elevated. What is the diagnosis so over here? It's a hydrodidiform meal. That's why HCD is elevated. There's non-tender mass in the lower abdomen. And that's why she has such high blood pressure because hydrodidiform meal is associated with preeclampsia. Asian can present with preeclampsia with severe features at less than 20 weeks gestation. Question 153, what should be done for a woman with heavy ovulatory menstrual bleeding but no plans for future fertility and low risk for endometrial malignancy? This is endometrial ablation. This is for, um, she doesn't want any future fertility, so we would be willing to go with that, as opposed to the hysterosalbingography that, def- that detects cause of menstrual bleeding. Question 154, during induced labor at 36 weeks for a cre- preeclampsia with severe features, a woman is given prophylactic antibiotics. She develops dyspnea, wheezes, and hypothetical and she appears flushed. What is the cause? That's anaphylaxis. That could be caused, for example, by stings, meds, such as antibiotics and nuts. Amniotic fluid embolism is associated with DIC, and we would hear crackles, we would not hear wheezes. Question 155, fetal ultrasound of a woman at 26 weeks reveals bilateral ventriculomegaly and multiple intracranial calcifications in the basal ganglia. All right, so hepatosomegaly is also present. What's the diagnosis? So here we have these calcifications and the ventriculomegaly, that is toxoplasmagondii, where we see hydrocephalus and intracranial, intracranial calcifications. All right, and then you can take a look at the other diseases, what we'd see in those conditions. Question 156, a woman has a bicornate uterus. Which form of contraception is indicated? So the copper IOD don't work because it won't fit. We would go to the depot, medroxyprogesterone. Question 157, what is first-line prevention for migraines in pregnancy? It's going to be propanolol. That's how we prevent migraines. It's supposed to sumatriptan that aborts the migraines, but not prevention. And topiramate has fetal abnormality, so it's not indicated in pregnancy. Question 158, what is the greatest risk factor for full shoulder dystocia? It's going to be maternal weight. And short into pregnancy interval would be for uterine rupture. Question 159, a 27-year-old female smoker at 23 weeks gestation comes to the ED with vaginal bleeding that began after intercourse. The bleeding continues to soak, but doesn't hurt. Phenol monitoring is reassuring. What is the diagnosis? So she has this vaginal bleeding, and she continues, it doesn't hurt. So that is placenta previa, as we mentioned a few times before, placenta previa doesn't hurt. Question 160, an eight-year-old girl has had a malodorous vaginal discharge for several days, secondary retained toilet paper. What is going on over here? So we would give her anesthetic gel and irrigation with warm water to get out the toilet paper. Speculum examination is not done in little girls because it's too narrow. We would go with the vaginoscopy, but that's not what we do here. Question 161, during a tubal ligation, it is discovered that an asymptomatic woman has multiple intra abdominal lesions. Pathology reveals endometrial gland stroma and hemosiderin laden macrophages. So this is endometriosis, what's the next step? So since it's asymptomatic, reassurance and observation. No need to treat if it's asymptomatic. 162, patients with endometrial hyperplasia are treated with, so patients with endometrial hyperplasia are treated with progestin releasing IUD, because they were, what we talked about where she desires future fertility, and this is reversible. All right, and uh, clomiphene, for, we spoke about before, that's for PCOS, where we wanted to induce ovulation, okay? But in endometrial hyperplasia, we give progesterone-releasing IUD that offsets the ex- extra estrogen. Question 163, a 53-year-old woman complains of vulvopruritus with 
uh, erythema for a week. This has happened several times over the last few months. Microscopy reveals pseudohyphae, so she keeps on getting candida, candida, candida. What should you do? H hemoglobin A1C, because this is common in diabetes to get this recurrent candida. Question 164. A two-week postpartum patient has nuanced onset seizures, papilledema, and headache. She has no hypertension or proteinuria, and cats get ahead as normal. So she has no hypertension. It is not pre preeclampsia, even though that could present after birth. What's the next step? So here we're concerned for intracranial hypertension, so we don't get MR venography of the brain. Right, because that would be a concern over here with the papilledema, seizures, and headache. 165, a woman with menstrual irregularities in large ovaries on exam complains of infertility, which medication can help her with ovulation induction. So here we're talking about PCOS and letrozole would be helpful to neuropathase inhibitor induces ovulation, as opposed to the cyclic progesterone, which is given to PCOS patients, but that's for endometrial protection. Question 166, an 87 year old woman from a nursing home is evaluated for PMB, postmenstrual bleeding, and she has an edematous tender vulva, P is normal, and ultrasound. Down. The uterus is small with three millimeter endometrial lining. No adnexal masses are present, so it's three millimeters endometrial lining. We're not concerned about cancer here. What we are concerned about is sex abuse screening based on her history. Why should 167 and pregnant women have the right to refuse treatment as non pregnant patients? Even if the business does not represent the best interest of the fetus, it could kill the fetus. The answer is true because she is in charge until the baby is born. She could decide whatever she wants to do with her body. Question 168 to 65 year has postmenstrual bleeding and a one centimeter also lesion in the posterior vaginal wall. Endometrial stripe is three millimeters. What's the next step? So here we want to go for a vaginal biopsy, not endometrial because endometrium is fine. It's really the uh, vaginal canal we're worried about, so we want to get a biopsy. Concerning for vaginal squamous cell carcinoma, question 169, a woman with previously regular menses has not had a period in four months. What's the next step? So she has amenorrhea. We first want to go to the pregnancy test, then we would go for FSH, TSH, and proxy levels, but we always want to get the pregnancy test first. Question 170, a woman undergoes cervical colonization for CIN3. Pathology shows that all cervical margins are free of cancer. What's the next best step? Or free of neoplasia. What's the next step we want to get? Well, since she's high risk, we want to get co-testing every one to two years. It wouldn't be low, it wouldn't be good enough to get it every in, in three years because she's high risk. And by the way, if there are positive margins, we need to continue with surgery. Question 171. A woman with severe hypertemesis gravidarum develops altered mental status, oculomotor dysfunction, and gait ataxia. This sounds like Wernicke encephalopathy. What's the treatment? Thiamine followed by glucose is the treatment for Wernicke encephalopathy, penicillin, or something like Tabes dorsalis, which is not what's going on over here. Question 172. 10 days after delivery, her baby. A woman develops two days of high fever, hypotension, and diffuse macular rash on pelvic exam. Perennial laceration is tender. What's the next best step? So here, the macular rash and fever and this perennial laceration reminds us of toxic suction syndrome associated with staph aureus. We give Venco and clindamycin. 173, a 19 year old pregnant woman presents with nausea, high fever, and unilateral flank pain. Both mom and fetus are tachycardic. Uterus is non tender. So the unilateral flank pain and fever reminds us of acute pyelonephritis. And that's what's going on over here, as opposed to intraamniotic infection, which is a a diagnosis of exclusion. Well, we have the unilateral flank plane that makes this acute pile in a phrase more likely. Question 174, a woman has leakage of urine, dyspareunia, and a tender anterior vaginal wall mass, which bleeds upon palpation. What is going on over here? So we have this anterior mass, which bleeds. This is a urethral diverticulum, which bleeds upon palpation. And that's what's going on. It's an outpouching of the uterine hiatus. Question 175, which medication used to prevent preeclampsia onset in high-risk patients? That's aspirin. Aspirin, we have low dose aspirin at 12 to 28 weeks. But better before 16, that's giving to high risk patients aspirin. Question 176. An HIV pregnant woman at 37 weeks gestation is having contractions with cervical dilation. Her viral load is 5,000. So she's going into labor. She has a high viral load. We want to go with a C section. Vaginal is only if the viral load is below 1,000. But if a C section, we do since it's above 1,000, and we give zidovudine. Question 177, a 39-year-old woman at 36 weeks gestation with no significant medical history presents with blood pressure that's very high, and urine, protein, which conditions she at risk for? So preeclampsia is a risk for acute ischemic stroke. Preeclampsia is a risk for acute ischemic stroke. Question 178, a 20-year-old woman at 26 weeks has had intermittent leakage of fluid for the past seven hours. She has a, uh, so she has this, um, break, she broke her bag of water, temperature is 103, so she has an infection, so she'll break her bag of water and she has an infection at 26 weeks, we still have to deliver immediate induction because it could, uh, could be very fatal for mommy and baby, all right? Question 179, 13 is evaluated for acne, 
clitoris protruding. She doesn't have breast bud development. That's 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. We don't see any breasts in that. As opposed to androgen sensitivity syndrome, we would see breasts. And in cellulite, the cell tumor, we would see virilization. 180, a pregnant woman at 14 weeks gestation has blood pressure 145 over 96, which obstetric complication she had risk for. So again, pre, uh, this is a chronic hypertension. This is a risk for preterm delivery. Chronic hypertension is also a risk for fetal growth restricted and superimposed preeclampsia. A woman in her first trimester develops a white-gray malodorous vaginal discharge and labs reveal clue cells. What's the next step? So you see clue cells, we want to give oral metronidazole, which is safe during pregnancy, and clindamycin would have been another option. Question 182 on one goes into labor at 25 weeks. She's given endomethyl and tocolysis to inhibit contractions. What is she at risk for? So she's given... T- Indomethacin, that's a risk for oligohydramnios. That's one of the risks of tacolysis with indomethacin. And another would be premature closure of the ductus arteriosus, although we give indomethacin anyway because the benefits outweigh the risks. Que- question 183, if they're a nine-year-old woman and hasn't had her period in two months, pelvic exam shows 12 week size uterus and bilateral nexomasis. Ultrasound shows uterus filled with multiple small cysts but no embryo. The ovaries have a multilocular cystic appearance, beta HDL is elevated. What does she have? So this is hydrodidiform mole, which presents often with fecal luteal cysts. That's what we see. All right. Question 184, a woman without children has signs or early preg- of, early, a, of early pregnancy, morning sickness, am- amenorrhea, what's the diagnosis? There is no pregnancy going on here. So this is just psychological, this is pseudosiasis in which persistent non delusional belief of being pregnant in a non-pregnant patient could even make them think that they had a positive pregnancy test at home. That's what they tell you, but the truth is they're not pregnant. Question 185, how are uncomplicated perineal lacerations managed? And, um, NSAIDs and SIDBADs, not for antibiotics, that's when we see infection. Question 186. If pregnancy related nausea and vomiting do not subside even after dietary modifications, for example, small, frequent meals, bland food, what's the next step? We already spoke about this in hyperabsis gravidarum. We give vitamin B6 and hydroxylene, doxylamine, succinate, and H1 blocker. Question 187. A 35 year old woman with no significant medical history at 33 weeks gestation is found unresponsive by her son. She gradually gains consciousness. Blood pressure is a little high. Frontal lobe edema is seen on CAT scan. What's the next step? See here, we sound unresponsive and she gradually gains consciousness. That sounds like she just came out of a seizure. So she has hypertension in pregnancy with no significant medical history and she had a seizure. This reminds us of. Uh, pre- eclampsia, not preeclampsia, but eclampsia. We all give magnesium sulfate. All right, question 188. A woman who takes amphetamines or cocaine increases increase the risk of a fetus with fetal growth restriction because of the constriction. Question 189. A pregnant lady in her first trimester has gestational thrombocytopenia. So this is actually a benign finding where the platelets are low, but not too low. They're above 100, below 150,000. What do you do? So routine care, because it's fine. You don't have to worry about it. As long as there's no other findings, as long as it's just isolated, it's fine. Question 190, a pregnant patient comes in at 34 weeks with breach presentation and a previous classical C-section. What's the next step? So she has a previous classical C-section, C-section at 37 weeks. Question 191, patients with postpartum urinary retention should be treated with urethral catheterization. The oxybutynin would make it worse. That's for overactive bladder, bladder that would worsen urinary retention, but urethral catheterization for intermittent catheterization for her urinary retention. Question 192, which of the following is a contraindication to exercise during pregnancy? All of the above are cervical insufficiency, preclancy, anemia, placenta plevia. All these women should not be exercising in general during pregnancy. 193, which activity should all pregnant women avoid? All these very intense contact sports and things like this women should avoid. Pregnant women should avoid. A woman at 35 weeks starts developing frequent painful u- uterine contractions. Cervix is 470, 90% of face. So this, basically she's going into labor. Expectant management. You don't go, again, you don't go with tacolysis after 34 weeks, right? <clears throat> question 195. A 71-year-old woman has a firm white vulvar plaque that is very itchy. What's the next step? So here we want to go vulvar biopsy. Again, we want to rule out vulvar cancer and then we go for steroids. 196. A woman has Preterm, pre-labor, rupture of membranes at 33 weeks. What's the next step? So here we want to give prophylactic antibiotics and steroids. Question 187, at term gestation, the most likely cause of new onset oligohydramnios is breaking the bag of the water, spontaneous rupture of membranes. 198, a 42-year-old woman has pathologic nipple discharge. What's next step? We want to do both mammogram and ultrasound because both of them together greatly uh, increase the detection of introductal lesions. For example, a papilloma. Question 189, the initial menstrual cycles in adolescents are irregular and anovulatory due to, there's actually insufficient secretion of gonadotropin release hormone. That's what goes on in the immature developing hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Question 200, a 16-year-old girl complains of intermittent vaginal discharge. It's not aerosemitis. There's white mucoid odorless vaginal discharge, which shows squamous cells and, and these rare poly- polymorphonuclear leukocytes under the microscope. That's leukorrhea. It's a white odorless mucoid cervical discharge that typically presents mid-cycle due to increased estrogen levels prior to ovulation. A microscopic exam of the discharge reveals no evidence of inflammation or infection. 
And that's what we have over here. All right, so that's the end of this video, these 200 questions over here. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to have, without sound here now, 150 OBGYN facts I came across while doing questions. You can read them if you like, whatever, whatever works for you. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. All right, take care.